Hello, happy lunch and learn. We're gonna do three days this week on mold. We're gonna take the, the mold spore stuff first. So today is mold spores, tomorrow is spore fragments, and Wednesday we'll talk about all of the off-gassed chemicals that mold will secrete when it's happily metabolizing and growing and um, I joke, they're called mold farts. They're just metabolizing and letting it all go. Uh, and one of those is MPA, which some of you may have seen on your labs. So we'll talk about that on Wednesday. So today is all about mold spores. And then the end of March, this is the next time I had a big string of lunch times available, we'll go through all the mycotoxins. I have mycotoxin fact sheets. If you're in a situation right now where you're like, I can't wait till the end of March, I need the information, you can look at the mycotoxin name and go to my website, drkrista.com slash, enter the mycotoxin name, and there may be a fact sheet already up there that you can check out. Uh, so if you did drkrista.com slash gliotoxin, you could get the fact sheet and the information from that. If you're a practitioner and you're listening, I have much more complicated practitioner tech sheets for the mycotoxins and MPA uh, that you'll get with my upcoming course called Updates in Mold-Related Illness. It's all part of the course. So it's a gives you all the information, but also gives you a shortcut to what my protocol is, doses, that kind of thing for your patients. So, all right, let's get into it. Mold spores. And feel welcome to ask me any question. I mean, we want this to be a, a more like a Q&A. Um, I'm happy to share, you know, on top of things, but also just feel free to ask me any questions. So let's talk about mold spores. I think it's easier to to come to it from the mycotoxin you might be struggling with and then what mold that is. And because a lot of times people are trying to figure out, is it still in my house? Where does it like to grow? What color is it? That kind of thing. So I thought maybe we could talk about that and back into it a little bit by the mycotoxin so that you can start with mycotoxin. Yes, definitely aspergillus we're talking about. Um, you can look at the mycotoxin and we can talk about what mold that comes from. All right, so aflatoxin comes from Aspergillus flavus and Parasiticus. And when we look at what kind of food those two Aspergillus like to live in, um, they typically like building material like flooring, carpet, um, plywood, drywall. Uh, I recent, just in the last couple of weeks, we had a patient who had their attic was made with all really good old school plywood. And then they had a vent in or something where they had to cut out. And so they took the whole sheet out when they re-roofed. And uh, yes, this is gonna be recorded. It'll be on my Instagram, on my website, and um, up on YouTube if YouTube will let me talk about this. Um, I don't know why not, but they're really picky these days. All right, so they had removed the sheet of good old, like built in 1940s, you know, really good wood in their attic, and they put in OSB, which is oriented stranded board or something like that. So it's basically even more digested than plywood. So OSB is like way easier for mold to grow on because it's already been chewed up and it has more surface area for the mold to take advantage of even though they say that's not what happens. Um, so I can tell you going up into the attic and all my stuff on, um, uh, because I love to do home visits, they had no mold in their attic except that OSB board. It was completely green. And that's the classic mold we kind of know. Like aflatoxin and aspergillus is kind of the mold we think of when we think of the moldy bread. Penicillium looks that way too. However, these two molds can be really dark. They can be dark, dark green, or even black, depending on what they're growing on. So whatever a mold is growing on will determine its color, not necessarily just the species. Isn't that wild? So you can be having black mold, and it could be stachybotrys, which is what is called toxic black mold, but it could be aspergillus, which should also be called toxic black mold because it secretes a lot of things that are really not good for us. So, okay, let me go back. So, um, Aspergillus flavus and Parasiticus like flooring, concrete, carpet, plywood, drywall, ceiling tiles, those of you in work situations, paper, including the paper on drywall, that's why it likes drywall, 
um, cardboard. So the classic thing would be you store something in a box and you put it on the basement floor and that comes, you know, absorbs the moisture that inevitably is going to come through a concrete floor. And then the cardboard gets this kind of like fuzz and it can look like just a little bit of dust. It doesn't even have to necessarily be like a colony of mold. It can look like dust. One of the ways you can tell is you can take a flashlight and shine it. And I know that a lot of our inspectors that, that we trust on here, uh, mold finders and the Michael Rubino, who is a remediator, they can, you know, take a flashlight and I follow Martine Davis around a lot. If you shine it sideways, so tangential light on something, you can see whether it's dust or whether it's mold a little bit easier. And if you have a woods lamp, you can really tell because it glows. Okay, going back, cardboard, modified wood products, and leather. Leather shoes, leather belts, leather purses, leather, leather, leather. Okay, so that is Aspergillus flavus and Parasiticus, which are typically an aflatoxin producer. What about Chetoglobosin? So Chetoglobosin is the mycotoxin. We work backwards. Um, ketomium, or Chetomium, depending on what your inspector likes to call it, is a real water loving one and they're having problem in water treatment plants and stuff with this particular mold spore so it's it has kind of like a white or a pinkish color have you guys ever seen in your shower or your your toilet if you haven't cleaned it frequently it has this kind of slime that could be bacteria but that could also be ketomium it likes CPAPs tubings so the tube coming off of your dehumidifier if you're not continuously cleaning that with any, you know, flushing it. I like to flush mine with a um, essential oil blend. Um, water filters. So I have a, a vi video called Drink Ice Water, Get Dementia. On my website, you can go to the Pearls page. That's where all my video blogs are and all my like social media posts and stuff like that. I tested three different water filters because I thought it was just our house. I was just curious. I test everything. I can't help myself. Um, I tested my water filter when I was changing it. And I was like, I wonder, I wonder how the filter is, you know? So I sent it in through Martine for testing. And sure enough, uh, it came back with high, high levels of chetoglobosin, which can cross the blood brain barrier and can lead to dementia, changes, inflammation changes. So then I thought, well, okay, that's probably just my house because we had had mold. So I'm, I went to my parents. <laughs> Uh, and they had just changed theirs three weeks prior because I thought, well, maybe I was I was too late in changing my filter. Turns out there's that chetoglobosin too. There is no regulation on those carbon filters on your refrigerator. So in, in the video and here, I will double recommend just get the water out of your faucet or your filter, your, your regular filter. Refrigerator filters are problematic. And the the place where you go fill it up. I know Brian Carr on Mold Finders Radio or Mold Finders on um, Instagram has plenty of pictures of what that that place where you're getting your water and your ice. If you look upside down in there, there's some pretty moldy places because there's water. Okay, shifting gears to citronin, which comes from Aspergillus niger. Niger usually is means black. So this could look black. Um, Aspergillus awalental, awental, ostianus, fumigatus, which is also commonly found in food, um, niveus, awamori, parasiticus, penicillium, oh, and then shifting species, penicillium citronum, penicillium expansum, and monascus. So this is going to be typically lemon yellow, but again, depending on what kind of food it's eating, it can change its color. And this likes building materials such as wallpaper, big time, citronin from wallpaper, wood, drywall, linoleum, that especially linoleum that has trapped water, and insulation paper, just like drywall paper. All right, so that's citronin. What do we want to talk about with citronin? Citronin, oh, I do have a fact sheet on citronin, which we're talking mycotoxins later, but um, these molds and the mycotoxins they they can, um, whatever, secrete, um, can be really hard on the kidneys. Really, really hard on the kidneys. Um, aspergillus in citric acid. Yes, so as citric acid is made from aspergillus niger, typically. 
And that is, what they do is they ferment it and then they take the juice from that and then the, they'll um, extract the citric, citric acid from it. So if you actually tested the citric acid, there'd be no spores, no fungal, you know, it's not like you're getting a bunch of spores when you have citric acid. That said, a lot of mold sick people, not a lot, a few mold sick people have trouble and have reactions to citric acid. I have a post about what the symptoms are on my pearls page on my website. So go to drkrista.com slash pearls, or you can go to the search function and just put in citric acid. A lot of people are fine with it, but if you are that person that you're like, this is so weird, every time I take this supplement, I have a problem. Or every time I drink, um, you know, a lot of fruit juices like lemonade, they add citric acid to because it's a really good preserver. It's a good preserver because it kills other living things. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, the, if you're reacting to that and you're starting to see the trend that, oh my gosh, it's this thing that has citric acid in it, and it's this thing, then just avoid that until you get better for mold. Once you get better for mold, it's not a problem, which is nice. Okay, gliotoxin. Somebody says, scary, sounds like one has to be a, a world-class mycologist and memorize a million molds in order to take control of your illness. I hope that's not what I'm, I'm, I hope what I'm doing is helping you realize that you have information and then, uh, yeah, but I think, I think a lot of us share your opinion very much. So that's why I wrote a book about it. So I do have a little, I made myself some notes today, but I do have a little, uh, I don't know if you guys can see this. And this is taken from my book. Um, and it shows you what molds and my, what mycotoxins come from what molds. And so that's all in print. So you don't have to be memorizing this. Gliotoxin, let's talk about gliotoxin. That comes from all, potentially any aspergillus species, or we'll just say many aspergillus species, and trichoderma. So trichoderma is kind of the one that classically is going to become like foot toenail fungus um, and also yeasts. So the colors can be all over the place. What color of mold is it, am I getting gliotoxin from? Well, it could be trichoderma, it could be aspergillus. So again, aspergillus is default color is light green, but could be anything. But trichoderma and yeast tend to be kind of a light yellow, golden, you know, very, very faint golden color. What are their building materials that they love? Flooring, carpet, textiles, wood, plywood and modified wood products like that OSB board and concrete. By the way, um, ketomium can grow in concrete as well. And you'll hear from a lot of the, the IEPs that, oh, nothing can grow on concrete. They're technically true. It can grow on concrete, but it's growing on the dust, that fine particulate matter that's just above the concrete. Concrete makes an enormous amount of dust. That's why a lot of people that have allergies tend to need to coat those with, you know, coat their concrete floor with something. So because it can come from yeast, that means if you have a candida overgrowth, you can have problems with this mycotoxin. But um, all of these molds that I'm talking about are very, very potent stimulators of mast cells. And so are the yeasts. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Okay, ochre toxin is from um, the species Aspergillus ochraceus. Aspergillus niger, Penicillium versicosum, varicosum, Penicillium nordicum, and Penicillium chrysogenum. So these can take on any color because we're talking about both Aspergillus and Penicillium species and the Aspergillus species that can be black, Aspergillus niger. But typically this is going to be your light green to dark green color. Favorite building materials for these guys is flooring, carpet, Ceiling tiles, again, think about your workplace, think about where you grocery shop, um, and heating ducts. This is quite common to see in heating ducts. All right, and then xerilinone is from Fusarium species. We haven't talked about Fusarium yet, but um, because it's it has its own, um, the trichothecenes are from Fusarium species, Stachybotrys, um, so let's talk about the ones that make trichothecene. So we have um, uh, Stachybotrys, Fusarium, Wallemia, Trichoderma can also make trichothecenes. And those are the ones that um, kind of create the press 
for how mold can make people sick, even though there's plenty more. And those are typically going to be things that are in the darker colors. Um, that's where you might see in a mix of the spores, you might see like a light green outer, and then like a, as it gets to the inner part of the colony, you see the darker stuff. So that means you have, if you see any of these, Fusarium, Stachybotrys, Wolemia, Trichoderma, those are molds that are getting a consistent amount of humidity and a consistent amount daily, like, you know, it's consistency. When you see those in your space, you know you have an ongoing moisture issue. It could just be humidity if you live in a really humid place. So if you're in a humid place, you have to manage your indoor humidity. Otherwise, anything that is organic can host mold growth, which is so creepy. So I recommend for my patients to get little humidistats. You can get them at the hardware store. You can get them at um, pet stores, like the little reptile tank ones. And, um, oh good, I'm not the only one whose silver alert made a phone go nuts, okay. And I didn't even read the alert, so hopefully I'm not gonna be <laughs> in an earthquake or something in a moment. But all right, so get each of get one for each room of your house and put a humidistat into every room because all homes are different. And you need to monitor that humidity in all seasons because each season does a different thing to your house. Some seasons pressure the house so that things that are in the walls come into the space and some seasons suck from the house. So whatever you might have in your crawl space or your basement pulls it up into your living space. So you wanna know what's going on with the humidity in every room. Make sure the humidistat isn't right by a window. So you would put it, look up how to test radon. You would put your, um, your humidistat in the same location as radon. So not on the floor, not near a window, and someplace where it's gonna be more stagnant in the room. So I usually set it, like in a bedroom, I'd set it on the bedside table, that kind of thing. Okay, so spores, fungus, are one of the most potent things to stimulate mast cells. So let's shift gears into the mast cell thing and be sure to re-ask your question if you had asked a question in the first round because I lost all of that. So if you have a question, please do um, fire away. Okay, so I wanted to read a quote from a study that I found about mast cells and fungi because it just sums it up so well. They say for their strategic location at vascularized, meaning lots of blood, mucosal, meaning the lining of our respiratory passages, our gut, our skin, surfaces. So for their strategic location at vascularized mucosal surfaces, combined with a unique versatility, mast cells are well positioned to respond to fungi and or fungal allergens. So many cases of allergies in my experience, even before I was the mold lady, is from an indoor mold exposure. Why? So mold spores can recruit a lot of mast cells to the surface, and then they can, um, you can have a normal allergy, we'll talk about that in a minute, but once you get that mast cell recruitment, the mast cells can secrete thousands of inflammatory mediators. They're like a cluster bomb, because they can also secrete little inflammatory mediators that set off other inflammatory mediators. So it's just like, it's a, it's a creeping wildfire that can happen in that location. And so that's how you can go from having a true IgE classic allergy to then having allergy symptoms that just don't stop, you know? So mold spores, you can be allergic to mold. Absolutely. That's, and I see that with people who have had childhood mold exposures to a significant degree that their immune system tags it as like, this is going to be a problem for us every time we find this. And that's what they call an IgE reaction. So it's an immediate sensitivity. You get that mold exposure. You start with all the allergy symptoms. So itchy eyes, itchy nose, itchy ears, um, runny nose, weeping eyes, you know, the whole thing. Maybe you get a little headache. Maybe you get a little tired or spacey. Hay fever. You can get those types of reactions to mold spores, but you can be completely not allergic to mold and still be sick from mold. And this is a mast cell thing. So when you get exposed to those spores on your mucosal surfaces, mast cells get recruited and they start the fire. And mast cells don't necessarily react right away. Some can, but some of the little 
mediators that they secrete may take a day before we see it. And so it, it's harder to tie that this reaction happened from exposure to mold. That's what makes it kind of tricky for people where they're like, I'm not really sure if my work is okay or not because I feel okay when I get there. I'm not having an allergic reaction. And that's where I'm trying to spread the word of like, and <laughs> it, it may not be a classic IgE allergy reaction that you're having to the mold. It could be a reaction that it involves mast cells. It could also be a mycotoxin reaction, which we're gonna talk about um, at the end of March. Okay, so uh, what, what about mast cells? Mast cells 101, real, real, real quick, is they're part of our immune system. They're part of the surveillance of our external surfaces. And the body thinks of the gut as external. So that means our respiratory passages, our gut lining, and they're called, they are differently differentiated. Differentiation of a cell means it doesn't figure out its assignment. So I would think of differentiation as a cell's assignment. Mass cells don't find out their assignment until they find themselves in the tissue they got recruited to. So they're gonna act a little differently in the brain than they would in the sinuses, than they would in the gut, the stomach versus the intestines, the skin. So this is gonna be something where everyone could have a slightly different reaction to having their mold exposure when mast cells are involved because they're gonna be differently behaving depending on how and why they were recruited. And again, they are like cluster bombs. So once they go off, boom, 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 boom. So that's why I like to use things with mold spore problems and mast cell problems that not only calm down the IgE reaction, the allergy reaction, like quercetin, luteolin, fisetin, um, but also rutin, astaxanthin. I could keep going. That's like a yellow color band of bioflavonoids. But also using things that, that halt mast cell dumping. Vitamin C being the biggest one. Nettles. Nettles are a very natural source of quercetin, but they, all have, they also have this other magical thing where they stabilize the mast cells and then they also block histamine. Histamine is one of the things that mast cells will secrete, but they're not the only thing. So we want to make sure that we're paying attention to all of the things. Um, one of the things they can secrete is an interleukin that perilla, the plant perilla, can shut down. Um, Maybe it is histamine, and then every time you eat, then the body has like this whole histamine reaction. You can use an enzyme called DAO or diamine oxidase to digest that histamine and get it out of the way. So I just want to make sure that you guys are understanding that you could have a mold problem, and it could be not a mold allergy. It could be a mast cell problem, and it can be mycotoxins, and also mold farts. And if you once once you have this recruitment happening with the spores, you can become allergic to all the other IgE type classic allergies. So if you've never been allergic to dogs and suddenly you're allergic to dogs, you've never been allergic to grass, but then when the grass comes out, you start to react. You've never been allergic to the trees. And then when the trees are, are you know, pollinating or whatever, you have your reaction. And we can chase that other one but really what we need to do is to pay attention to the cause. And the cause is quite often um, mold colonized on those surfaces and mast cells continuing to try to eradicate. In my experience, the time where a mold spore or a, a fungal, so it could be mold or yeast, goes from colonization to, hey, I see a window, maybe we can become infection, is when we get a ton of mast cell recruitment. Okay, so I'm gonna go with some questions. Um, gosh darn silver alert. Oh, I love the props to Dr. DeSoto, she's amazing. Even in the desert, yes, monitor your indoor environment because we have uber tight homes um, that we don't, there's not enough air exchange. So we are trapping a lot of humidity. In the 70s when we went to all this um, super efficiency, we also don't have enough indoor air exchange. So. Lumber mold, yes, and I will tell you why. <laughs> and again, I will recommend going to see the Michael Rubino at the Michael Rubino for builder things, but uh, builders are now being told that they don't have to follow the gold standard when they're putting up a house, which is to cover fresh lumber with a tarp and leave it open on both sides so it can breathe, but to protect it from the elements and to place it above the soil. 
Well, in my neighborhood where they're building new houses, everything's sitting in the dirt. It's sitting in the rain, it's sitting in the snow. So yes, even lumber mold can be a problem because if it wasn't treated appropriately in the building process. Can you reverse cold urticaria from mold exposure? Yes, yes, definitely. And cold urticaria is means you have a lot of mast cell recruitment. So I would be really talking with your doctor about getting on the antifungals as soon as possible um, because it is that, that point of colonization. So let's say you have this little mold out here in colonization. I'm just colony, you know, a colony. And then it says, hey, maybe we can actually move in. And then it starts to do this, root. It starts to put in roots. And that's when we get a lot of urticaria problems. And I, again, I love nettles for that. Nettles is so, so, so fantastic. Still high spore counts after remediation, mostly aspergillus. So, so are these spores. Mycotoxin in all my cupboards, drawers. Dishes, silverware, fridge, I'm ingesting besides inhaling. Yes, unfortunately. Um, so it sounds like you need to have remediators come back. Sometimes you will see that they did a really good remediation, but they didn't do good enough containment. And they may not have vented the contained field outside. They must do it outside. Through an air scrubber is not going to clean mycotoxins. How do you figure out if it's just histamine or if oxalate, salicylate are affecting you when when smells, mold, and chemical sensitivities are in play too. I'm trying to get the whole question in my head, but um, it's, so the, uh, they all kind of come from the same cause. There are people who are, are like super oxalate producers, so this is not for you people. This is for the people who have oxalates from fungal overgrowth. Fungal and yeast overgrowth, so mold and yeast overgrowth in the body will make you more susceptible more sensitive, sorry, to oxalates and salicylates. Um, parasites can do that too, by the way. And um, I'm sorry, oxalates and salicylates on the fungal histamine can be for mold and fungal overgrowth and also parasites. So how do you figure out which one is the problem? Um, remember, if it's a mast cell problem, it could be more than any of those. Um, and so by settling down, uh, getting out of the mold, that's number one, get out of the mold, and then by settling down the mast cells with things that will help reduce the inflammation, reduce their, their dumping. Because once you have mold on board, the mast cells will have three things that happens. We get more recruited um, from the fungal overgrowth on the surface, more mast cells, they'll dump their contents more, and mycotoxins make mast cells last longer. So they can dump longer. It's just mold is so wily. So how do you figure out? A lot of times just trying with diet, like trying to go on a low histamine diet. If it makes a difference, there's your answer. Um, if it doesn't, that's not your answer. And then try a low oxalate diet. Oxalates are probably easier to avoid than the histamines. But all that gets better when you treat yourself for mold. Um, how do you test for mold allergies? That is from your doctor. We'll do an antibody test against mold spores. You can also do an antibody test against mold mycotoxins, which is through my myco lab, but most doctors and your insurance could, should pay for a mold allergy test. You can, if your doctor doesn't do it, they may refer you to an allergist immunologist to do it. Okay. Oh my goodness, you guys, it's already at time. That was a fast lunch and learn. <laughs> Holy moly. All right. Tomorrow we'll be talking about mold spore fragments, and I'm happy to to field questions um, as they come up because we don't have as much to say about mold spore fragments, but you never know with me and mold. I really like talking about it. All right, thanks for joining me, you guys. I'll see you tomorrow. Bye.